All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here and joining us for this virtual happy hour. My name is Alex Rivera. I am board vice president for Civic Story. I work in environmental stewardship for the Mercer County Park Commission. And I hope everybody has their drink. I gotta get this right in front of my face so everybody can see it. <laughs> I've got the bikini season pomegranate kiwi ghosts. So oh. yeah, sounds good, right? My girlfriend got me into sours. I really like them a lot. And this is one of my favorites. It's a very summery drink. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so tonight we are going to have a lightly curated conversation with some uh, change agents and environmental leaders. All of us here are those. So we wanna have an interactive conversation. <clears throat> so as um, we are speaking with our guest speakers, Tobias Fox from Newark Science and Sustainability and Lee Clark, uh, environmental justice organizer for the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters. Feel free to drop any questions or comments you have in the chat. Frida Ruiz, who I will be introducing shortly, will be moderating the chat. Um, so, you know, if somebody's saying something that really resonates with you, please feel free to drop something in the chat so we can guide the conversation that way. Um, <clears throat> there will also be a dedicated question and answer session at the end. So, you know, if you gotta let something marinate, that works out too. So before we head over to the bar permanently for the night, I would like to introduce and recognize two of Civic Story's youth leaders. Their time with, Civ with Civic Story will be coming to an end at the end of the month, and we want to send them off properly and uh, wish them the best. So I'm going to introduce first Jamie Kim, who is a, I believe, sophomore at Princeton University, and she came to us from the Princeton Program for Community Engaged Scholarship. Maria, if you're out there, thank you. Maria is the coordinator for that program. Jamie, can you uh, tell us briefly about what it is that, that you did for Civic Story and what you learned, please? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Alex, um, for the introduction. So my name is Jamie and uh, I worked with Civic Story uh, these past eight weeks on a research project as a research intern. And so I created this competitive analysis to compare how different news outlets in New Jersey are reporting or approaching to report environmental news. And since Civic Story focuses a lot on civics, I paid special attention to um, news reports on sustainability action, which can encompass how municipalities, campuses, or local people are making changes to help the environment. And I also conducted a sentiment analysis as a component to analyze the emotions and attitudes um, within news articles. And I've learned a lot through this project. Uh, prior to this internship, actually, I never really had much experience or knowledge in journalism. And so I didn't really know what to expect coming into this. And, but it's been a really great learning experience. And I got to learn a lot more about what goes on in the newsrooms and how journalism in New Jersey works. And also just how the purpose of journalism isn't just simply to report news but more importantly, to reach, uh, reach more of the audiences and convey the right messages, make sure a diversity of voices are being heard and represented. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your contributions to Civic Story, Jamie. We really appreciate it. Um, and hopefully we'll hear from you again tonight asking a question to Tobias or Lee, because we do wanna emphasize and make sure that we cover youth leadership in all the issues that we talk about. So I'm going to introduce Frida Ruiz, who is a youth, is youth advisor to Civic Story. We'll be heading to Princeton University in the fall. She'll be co-moderating, uh, checking out the chat, looking for your comments and uh, questions. Frida, what have you been doing for Civic Story and what have you learned? Yeah, again, thank you for the great introduction. And I'm so delighted to be here, especially as a youth and an incoming college student. And again, um, for those who are not familiar, I'm Frida Reese, and like he mentioned before, I'm student advisor at Civic Story for around the past nine months. And I started with the Clear Language, the Clear Language Forum, 
that occurred on December 14th, where I was a co-moderator. And the Clear Language Forum consisted of an exercise where different students and professionals had three minutes to explain why the world is warming and how to stop it. And I continued by co-writing an article with fellow colleague Kimberly Tran about the Clear Language Forum and what we took from it. And since then, I've been active through several forums slash events, and each time I've gained some new knowledge or experience um, from partnering with Civic Story, uh, mainly like uh, Jamie said, how, um, how it really does impact, you know, the way that journalists, like the way they use their language and the way that they use that message to resonate with people is very important. And it's such an honor to have a platform to share my voice as an emerging leader. And I hope as a young person, I do not only have the chance to learn from professionals and those with more experience than me, but also share my perspectives and ideas. Thank you. Frida, it's so nice to hear you say um, that Civic Story gave you a platform for amplifying your voice. That's really nice to hear. And in my short time with Civic Story, I only joined the board in May of this year. I've really come away uh, knowing that Civic Story is very much committed to youth platform and youth leadership. So it's very nice to hear that affirmation. All right, we're gonna leave the kids in the lounge to enjoy their smoothies and we're gonna head to the bar. So make sure everybody has their drink and we're gonna get to chatting with uh, Tobias and Lee. We're gonna start with Tobias and I'll just reintroduce him very briefly. Tobias is the managing director and founder of Newark Science and Sustainability. I know that his work centers significantly on urban agriculture, uh, something that is part of my work history. So I'm really excited to hear what it is that um, he has to share. So like I said, this is a curated conversation. I'm gonna ask um, Tobias a couple questions. You know, we'll have a conversation. If there's anything that you want to share in the chat, please enter it. Frida's watching. Um, and we may just help us guide the conversation, please. So Tobias, I'm going to start with uh, a question that, you know, you can just really take in any direction you want to. So I want to know more about your journey to urban agriculture. Um, I know that for me as an environmental professional, I didn't, I didn't know that I was coming to this point in my life, but a big sense of responsibility to my community and wanting to understand all of the potential solutions to challenges really drove me to this world. So tell me about how you came to urban agriculture and how has your sense of responsibility to your community impacted that? Um, well, I mean, as, as a child, I liked to play in the dirt. I didn't, I didn't, uh, had nothing to do with agriculture, just going to the park because I lived across the street from one. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, my, my educational background, uh, first, I like to say I, I was born in Newark. I grew up in East Orange, lived in Urbanton. So um, Newark, Urbanton, and East Orange has been a circle of my life. Um, my, um, my parents and their siblings, you know, my elders, uh, growing up, they were they were laborers, you know, artists, uh, brick masons. And so there was no agriculture uh, in my household. Um, my educational experience consisted of creative writing, book publishing, filmmaking. I'm also a photographer. And so it wasn't until um, 2011, uh, coming out of um, the book publishing industry, uh, I found myself uh, not having a job. Uh, no income, no money in my pockets, uh, needing a place to live, sleeping on my cousin's couch, uh, collecting uh, EBT or food stamps at the time as a means to feed myself, and trying to figure out how do I reinvent myself from all this, you know? And so, um, and I knew I didn't want to go back in publishing. I knew I didn't want to go into education. And so I'm just trying to figure out, you know, my dream was to be a filmmaker. And so I'm trying to figure out, like, how do I get there? And so, um, uh, in October of 2011 is when I learned about a group of people who had marched on Wall Street demanding economic justice. And I thought they were like literally uh, like giving out some handouts or something. So I was like, well, I need to get over there because I need some of what it, whatever it is they are trying to give out. And so especially if it's economic justice. And so um, 
I was able to catch a path train uh, to World Trade Center. I walked a few blocks down to Zuccotti Park. And up until that point, I thought rallies and protests, I thought it was a thing of the past. I thought it had no rebel, uh, relevance uh, in today's society. Um, but I, I turned out to be completely, completely wrong. Uh, and so what I witnessed at Zuccotti Park was mind blowing. For me, uh, it was uh, an epiphany uh, because these group of organizers managed to develop the social systems needed for a human society to exist uh, in this small space. And so they had a people's kitchen and it wasn't just giving out like charity sandwiches. You know? And so they were giving out full meals. Uh, if you are vegan or vegetarian, they were telling you to line up on that side of the kitchen, all others on the other side of the kitchen. They had a medic station, a people's library, a media uh, station, they had a drum circle going on, uh, working groups. Uh, and so all of this was mind blowing to me. And it was in that space in 2011, uh, during my uh, experience and eye-opening, uh, uh, my eye-opening and, and awakening to the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, is when I actually started meeting people who uh, were farmers. Uh, in rural and urban environments. And so one guy was like, I'm an urban farmer. I'm like, well, what the heck is that? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, and so he's like, I'm, I grow food in Brooklyn, in the rooftops, backyards, front yards, indoors, factories, wherever. And, um, and, at, and at, during the same time, I started meeting sustainability technicians, people who uh, were trans, uh, transferring the sun and wind into electricity. They were also transforming pedal bikes into generators. And so this was mind blowing for me. Uh, and I got involved in organizing rallies and protests. Today I see, I see uh, rallies and, and, and protests as a form of social advertisement. Uh, it awakens the social immune system. Uh, it brings attention to someone's or people's grievances. And so it does uh, play an important role in our society and it, and it is highly relevant. Uh, and so, um, and then in November, I kind of transitioned myself into organizing with a small group who started Occupy Newark. Uh, again, this is in 2011. And uh, because of my educational background and uh, the skill sets that I had developed in um, management and organizing uh, in the workplace, I was able to translate that or you know, transfer that into um, community organizing. So. Uh, in a matter of weeks, I found myself uh, becoming a lead organizer within Occupy North. And uh, going into 2012, I decided to organize um, a community group, which at the time was called Occupy North's uh, Science and Sustainability Working Group. And it was just about me and nine other green local enthusiasts just wanting to do some green stuff. And so we would organize a trip to an or organic farm or organize a solar technology workshop then a good friend of mine, uh, uh, who I met at the time, uh, informed me that the city of Newark uh, has an adopt a lot program where you can adopt a vacant lot uh, with the purpose of transforming that vacant lot into some type of green space and you pay a dollar and sign an annual lease. And I was like, this is awesome. I want to do this. And so I started watching YouTube videos uh, about more about agriculture and um, uh, above ground growing and raised bed gardening and all this stuff. And, um, and then I, I remember um, it was in early spring, I helped organize a large group of people um, uh, to uh, enter a vacant lot that we adopted uh, in 2012 and help transform that vacant lot into a community garden. And I would come there every day as I'm helping to organize these uh, groups of people, um, residents, college students, um, people from organizations and so forth. Uh, and uh, three people, uh, these three middle-aged European American women who was a part of the Occupy Newark Science and Sustainability Working Group, they would notice how I would just stand around and watch everyone work every time I come there. And so they walked up to me and says, Tobias, you know, we, we, we really love what you do. You're a great organizer. Um, but we notice every time you come to the garden, you know nothing, you don't do anything, uh, you don't do any work. You just watch everybody else work. You don't know anything about gardening, do you? Wow. And he says, no, actually, <laughs> I says, no, actually, I don't. And so they says, well, we're, we're going to teach you everything we know. And they became my teachers and my mentors. Um, and I, like a sponge, I was able to absorb that information. And that set me off on this journey of becoming 
uh, how people describe me today as an urban punk. I mean, there's just so much to unpack there. I really appreciate you sharing that story. Um, I, there, there are so many things that I want to follow up on. I, I'm just going to ask you about a term that you use, the social immune system. I was really, that really stood out to me. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, how you define that and how uh, that the social immune system is connected to urban agriculture? Well, I mean, <laughs> I think it's just connected to our, uh, you know, sense of being, right? And so, um, you know, if you are being attacked with some foreign elements in your body, you have an immune system that fight that off. And so, um, or at least try to help you fight that off. Um, and then um, when you are struck with grievances, um, there are things inside of us, you know, this alarm system that goes off um, and tell us that something is not right. And so uh, we may not have the answer or the solution to it, but it awakens us up to that issue, that, that grievance, that problem, that concern. And so, and that's how I begin to see and define uh, rallies and protests as a means to awaken uh, someone's social immune system. Uh, to ring an internal alarm uh, that pulls them to a particular grievance. Can you, can you talk about uh, a journalist's role in the social immune system? Or well, documentation, you know, I mean, uh, you know, how do we um, translate someone's grievance, you know, for that way uh, a large group of people can process that information, right? Uh, and so, and not, uh, misjudge that person. Uh, and so, um, and, and so I'm a writer and I love, you know, I love the beauty of language and how people can put words together to pull on someone's emotion. And so uh, journalists have that ability to do that. And, um, and, and some of it is, uh, some of that ability is, is misguided, whereas though, uh, what I mean by misguided is that is um, sometimes, a lot of times it's served in a specific interest um, but other times when you have people who really wanted to just express uh, the, um, the beauty of ideas or, the, um, uh, or the, the, the anger and frustration of one's grievance and suffering, um, I'm really pulled, in, pulled into that, you know, to that. And so journalists have a huge, I mean, part of what I do um, as, um, you know, managing a grassroots community-led organization um, is, you know, how do I tell people's stories in the community? Uh, and so my, my, my thing is right now is uh, increasing people's uh, access to fresh, healthy food. And so as a photographer, I'm always, you know, documenting that. Uh, as uh, a person uh, with a background in filmmaking, I'm always documenting that um, and looking for others who I can collaborate with to kind of uplift these voices um, through some narrative, uh, you know, narrative storytelling, and journalists have the ability to do that. I think that that's a, a really beautiful testament to to journalism. As as someone who's new to the space, that that felt very um, inspiring to me. You, we talked as we were preparing for this. Um, I told you about an experience that I had where I was doing community engagement for the establishment of the Capital City Farm in Trenton, New Jersey. So someone said that um, we, as the people seeking to implement it and as organizers, were trying to bring them back to the plantation. And I told you that, that I had just hadn't thought about it from um, that perspective. And so when you made the comment about telling stories, I, I thought about the brief conversation we had with that. Can you talk a little bit about how people how different people connect with the idea of urban agriculture and just how they might process it. Any stories that you're comfortable sharing? Yeah, in that? So first of all, I am so removed from uh, American slavery as we know it, you know, bondage um, and, uh, you know, uh, working in fields. I'm so physically removed from that. But there is genetic memory, right? You know, genetic memory that is passed on through DNA um, and so an association, you know, and so one stories that's been passed on and down from generation to generation, um, those stories are filled with imagery. And so 
And so when a person associate um, agriculture today uh, with a form of slavery, I just see that, I internalize that as um, they have either uh, genetic memory or they have received these passed down stories um, mm -hmm. that still feel very real to them, right? And so, um, and so, yeah, and so, but I have other people who said, you know, to me, um, they say it in a different way in terms of uh, agriculture. They say, hey, look, we know um, that, um, you know, eating from the garden or farm is healthy, um, you know, fruits and vegetables is healthy, um, but this is work, you know, are you gonna pay me for this? And so they, they, it's just, I don't know, I don't know, I think, I think, you know, sometimes we fall, we become so victimized by our own privilege that we um, have this assumption um, that what works in your community will work in everyone else's community, you know? And so um, they come with this assumption that no one uh, works uh, in an urban environment. They're just sitting in the house watching TV and waiting for something good to happen. Uh, or they just um, just have all this time on their hand, you know? And so, um, and so, you know, for me, I see uh, the work I do as a, as a labor of love. I don't come at it with assumptions that um, um, the neighbors in a community um, are going to come and assist me with this work. Um, I, don't assist, I don't assist any electricians with the work they do, but I expect when I hit that light <laughs> switch on, I expect my electric, uh, electricity to, to work. You know? right. I want that light to come on when I hit that light switch. And so, um, but I had nothing to do with that process. Uh, when I get in my vehicle and drive my car, I expect to get from point A to B, um, but I had nothing to do with the process of that automobile being constructed or made. And so with, when it comes to food production, I don't expect everyone uh, to jump in and, and get involved in it. And so, but as a, um, as a person um, that is committed to this work, um, I feel like it's my responsibility to at least um, share the knowledge and information and do what I can to uh, deliver fresh, healthy food and make it more accessible to people in my community. Well, Tobias, thank you so much. You shared uh, a lot, and I see that in the chat there have been some lively comments. Um, thank you. Thank you again. There's so much to unpack there, and we could definitely have a lot, many more conversations. Tobias, before, before I move on to Lee, tell us what you're drinking. I'm drinking some like Tennessee apple Jack Daniels with um, with um, some um, watermelon cubes, you know. It's, so that sounds so great. <laughs> Tobias paid for he didn't. It wasn't well liquor. He got he got he paid for the premium. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, uh, Tobias. Peace. We will that de we'll definitely be talking more when we hit the dedicated question and answer session. Uh, Lee, you there? Yep, I'm right here. All right. Thanks again for joining us, Lee. I'll reintroduce Lee briefly. Uh, he is an env environmental justice organizer for the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters. Lee, I understand that you need to drive home. So you're drinking water, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Very responsible. We appreciate that. Um, so Lee, we'll just jump right into the conversation uh, and I'll start off with the same question that I asked Tobias. Tell me about your journey to, uh, to where you are now. Uh, what, what were your formative experiences? Just tell me, please. Interested in hearing. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'll try to give you the um, quick turnaround on it. So, I mean, essentially, so I, I was, uh, I would say I, I was very fortunate. Um, I grew up, uh, originally from New Jersey, uh, but I spent a lot of my life, you know, back and forth between New Jersey and Eastern PA, rural PA, uh, where I spent a lot of my time growing up. But I spent a lot of my time growing up in nature, around the woods. Um, most of my life was spent near the Lehigh Valley, uh, the Lehigh River or the Delaware River. Um, so from a young age, I was introduced to the outdoors, uh, hiking, camping, hunting, uh, all that. Um, so from a very young age, I had a deep 
I began fostering a deep appreciation for what nature had to offer um, and the, assess the easy accessibility that I had to it um, as a result really gave me, um, I would say a really a good perspective of what it could offer both on your mental health, your physical health, uh, clean air, clean water, open space. Um, so from a very young age, I was introduced to that. Um, as far as my education, I went to Ryder University, did my undergrad in political communications, eventually went back for my master's in business. Um, but by no means did I ever think um, I'd be making a career out of the environment. And I'm so glad that I did. Um, but a lot of my background before I was working at New Jersey LCB, um, I was working on campaigns as a community organizer. Um, even when I was an undergrad, I was working on, I worked on uh, Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman's 2014 run for Congress, Cory Booker's uh, Senate run in 2013. Um, as I'm trying to think through all of them, uh, Tom Alonowski's uh, run for Congress in 2018, all that. But I think the pivotal moment for me was in 2016 when I was working on Hillary Clinton's campaign uh, for U.S. president. Uh, she was running against then candidate Donald Trump. Um, I was based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania doing the usual thing as a full-time organizer. Um, but the difference between that campaign and all the other ones that I worked on was we lost and we lost badly. Um, so that was, a, that was an experience for me. But it's a turning point for me because one of the first things that came out of the um, Trump elects transition team was the plan to cut the EPA funding by 31%. Mm -hmm. So this put a red light in my head that I had to do something. Um, because I wasn't someone who was just going to sit by idly, uh, go on social media, you know, complain about my unliking of policy. So I decided to take my community organizing experience and find an issue campaign that I could really get behind, namely the environment. So in 2017, uh, New Jersey League of Conservation Voters were looking for a full-time uh, field organizer for a year-long campaign they were running. I applied for the job. I got the job um, and we did amazing work. The whole goal of that campaign was to make the environment a top five issue in New Jersey during the gubernatorial race. Um, and at the end of that year, we did exactly that. We made the environment a top five issue, which had never been before done before, uh, sorry, never done, had been done before because the environment just never really ranked that high amongst the interests of voters. It usually falls behind healthcare, jobs, economics, things like that. Education. Education, exactly. Um, but it became a top five uh, priority in both the primary and the general. So we we're very successful in running that education campaign and I was proud to be the field director for it. And it's funny because I was only supposed to be working at New Jersey LCB for a year because the grant was only good for a year. Come to find out, I'm here now nearly five years later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they decided to bring me on where I then ran um, the outreach program between both New Jersey um, and Pennsylvania uh, with outreach and volunteers. And currently in my role, I'm now the environmental justice policy manager. So I work on an intersectionality of where EJ policy meets outreach um, and how does that kind of affect communities? Uh, because as we know, policy is where you can make decisions where power comes from working with legislators. And we need to make sure that the best um, defense that many of these overburned communities have is sound policy, not only on the municipal level, but the state and federal levels. And we need right. more people of color working on these levels, being at those decision-making tables, making sure that the policy reflects the actual needs of the leaders in EJ communities. So just to sum up how I pretty much got here, that was kind of the road that I took. Um, I started out as a community organizer um, and I just went down the road uh, until I got into policy uh, because we need more change. We need more people talking um, and making, bringing about real authentic change in these communities. I think that it, it's really interesting that, you know, very challenging moments in both you and Tobias's life really brought you to where you are now. And I think that that's true of everybody. You know, you look back and you say, wow, this challenge really brought me to uh, a wonderful place. So thank you so much for sharing that, Lee. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the, the more difficult and challenging aspects of organizing. Obviously, 
you were tremendously successful in your what was only supposed to be one year, you're here five years later. Uh, can you t talk about some of the campaigns that didn't quite go the way that uh, you wanted and maybe what you learned from that? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so as I try to go through the movie reel in my head, um, yeah. I've worked on many campaigns with uh, New Jersey LCB, many environmental initiatives. Um, obviously, I guess the freshest one in my head is the Penny's Pipeline, uh, stretching between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, obviously, not too recently, the Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of Penn East uh, to use the use through the use of eminent domain to take private lands to lay down pipes uh, for their natural gas pipeline. Um, obviously, this is natural gas energy that the state does not need. Um, it's dirty. It's unnecessary. But obviously, that was a court decision that just was, you know, it was not what we expected to hear. Now, fortunately, right. there's a lot of other um, court and legal hurdles Penny's has to get through um, before they can lay down any pipes. But that was an initiative that I remember, you know, getting involved back in 2017 uh, when I was a field um, director and really working and organizing, um, going through um, Hunterdon County, uh, talking with folks on the ground about how they felt about, um, you know, a dangerous pipeline going through their lands in their backyards. Um, because we all hear the stories about the potential dangers and the very real dangers of these pipelines and what they can do regarding water contamination, soil contamination, explosions. Um, it's never a good thing. So if I had to think about one campaign that didn't quite go the way I expected or wanted to, um, definitely the fight against Penn East um, because mm -hmm. it's something that I've been involved with since 2017. We have organizers here at uh, New Jersey LCB that are far more involved with it now than I am since I've made my switch more into public policy. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just, it's an ongoing fight. But even though the US court decision came down as it did, we're seeing that the folks here in Jersey aren't letting up. Uh, the landowners, the activists, the legislators that are fighting against it are not giving up. And there are so many more hurdles that this pipeline has to get through that we're just gonna keep fighting this until it finally says, it's not worth it anymore. We're gonna protect, you know, until the pipeline people say it's not worth it anymore. Right. Well, that's really great to hear. I did know about the Supreme Court decision, but I didn't know that there were uh, many more hurdles that needed to be jumped over. So that is good to hear. Um, thank you for sharing that. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the word environmental justice means. Uh, in the conversation that we had preparing for this conversation, um, I talked a little bit about how environmental justice narratives, in my opinion, tend to be focused on, you've got this brownfield, you've got uh, this super fund, you've got this major polluter, and less of the conversation is on, uh, you know, the non-point source pollution type of thing. So you've got your heat islands, you've got um, general water pollution, which I know is being addressed through the stormwater management law, you've got, um, air pollution. So can you talk a little bit about how you've seen the term environmental justice evolve in meaning over time? Yes, definitely. And, and that's a great um, question. Thank you for asking that one. Um, I think it's a it's come a long way. Um, and I would definitely say what I would say environmental justice is, is definitely the intersectionality between environmentalism and social justice. Um, that's is essentially the short definition of how I would describe environmental justice when you take those two in, um, parallels and put them together. Um, it's definitely changed. I would even say within the past five years as recently, and I would think movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, which has really elevated environmental justice to the mainstream further, because we have to remember Environmental justice didn't start yesterday. You know, we, we just recently started hearing more about it on a mainstream level. But we have leaders working in this state that have been doing it for 10, 20, even 30 years. Like, but no one really paid attention to it un until, you know, Black Lives Matter really took the front stage. And with it brought up a lot of the systemat uh, systemic racism uh, that's within our country's base, you know, within our country's foundation. Um, and when the movement brought all that out, people started looking at the environment and the conservation movement in a different manner too. Now all of a sudden you're starting to see, you know, big funders 
getting involved and they're pushing good, large amounts, significant amounts of money to nonprofits and environmental activists too, to get involved in the fight because it's now this big thing. And we need to make sure that we're, that the majority of this money is going to the real warriors that have been doing this for years. Um, we have activists in New Jersey and, you know, there's so many, but, you know, names like Dr. Nikki Sheets that yeah. have been doing this for like it's longer than I've been alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who have, uh, same, really, same. Yeah, right. Who have really been leading the charge on environmental justice and advising uh, New Jersey DEP and multiple uh, governor administrations on, you know, what does it mean to have equitable policy in the state and on the federal level as well? So, I mean, to kind of get back to the what we're talking about, because I know you brought up uh, non-point source uh, pollution as well. Um, some things that we do need to move forward on, though, because as you know, a lot of the conversation is, you know, around brownfield, super fun sites, um, cumulative impacts as well. But we also have to be looking at things to measure general um, air pollution as well. So we need to increase air monitoring systems uh, because mm -hmm. throughout all of New Jersey, it's actually drastically underfunded. Uh, so much of the data we have on air quality in the state, um, I wouldn't say is up to snuff because our air monitoring systems are so underfunded and we need much more, especially in our most overburdened communities. Areas like the Ironbound, especially, which is one of the most highly polluted areas in the country, uh, to get the most accurate data possible because we're laying the foundation for new um, environmental laws like the cumulative impacts law that was passed last year. A lot of it's based off of um, air quality data collected by the state, but the question comes up, how accurate is that data? Um, and New Jersey has some of the lowest grade of air quality in the nation. You know, we have some counties ranking Ds, C minus in air quality. Um, so when we're looking at non-source non point pollution, sorry, non-point source pollution, it's a long day. <laughs> <laughs> we need to make sure that we're accurately calculating the data um, of how it's affecting our overburned communities. Um, when we're talking about heat islands, you know, urban heat island effects, we also have to take into account who's leading on this. We need to make sure that the municipalities on a municipal level are really leading the charge on how are we addressing this. Um, I just recently read um, that Sustainable JC, uh, Sustainable Jersey City, is actually doing conducting a study on the effects of urban um, island um heat island heating sorry it's so yeah. late right now um, <laughs> no i got you i'm following yeah, you. right um they were awarded ten thousand dollars to study the effects on jersey city and then to make recommendations of what could be done legislatively on the municipal level so i'm actually looking very forward to seeing that study come out um other studies have also been done on areas like camden back in 2004 um but it's a it's a fascinating area of research because i do believe that we need to expand to these areas to make more just and equitable um, laws and living conditions for our most overburdened com communities. Because until we can address this effect, um, you're always gonna see higher appliance costs um, because you know, you're know you using more air AC than your more affluent white areas because temperatures are just rising in areas like North, Jersey City, Camden, Hoboken, right. uh, just because of this effect. So the residents of these uh, areas are paying more um, in, electro in energy consumption. Um, they're more prevy to health issues like asthma uh, because they already have some of the highest rates of asthma and heart disease because of you know, higher emissions. So now you, what you're doing also is throwing on higher levels of temperature as well, which is now aggravating these health diseases. Right. So in order to of make course. more equitable environments, we do need to address these on a municipal level. I'm sorry if that's a little longer than expected. But. That's all right, Lee. You you were comprehensive. I, I really um, appreciate that. There's so much to follow up on. Uh, Frida, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to you. I know that there has been conversation and uh, a lot of questions. So do, is, was there, are there any specific questions for Tobias or any comments that you think should be read back? Yeah, but could I first ask a question myself? Of course, yes, please. Yeah, I have a question for Tobias. So I really liked the comment that you made about um, the possible social awareness that could come <clears throat> into effect with protests and other social 
movements and that and especially the term like um social immunity like that really like yeah that also stood out to me as well um but that got me thinking about people who think that you know protests or people posting things well not necessarily posting things online but um yeah like mainly protests and like signing petitions um that they don't really actually do anything in the end and are kind of a waste of time like what would you say to those people because like you're, well, you're definitely you, right with <laughs> your right mind of well, you said two things signing petitions and then people um who feel that um protesting um doesn't um, do anything. And so um, I was one of those persons. So I was one of those persons. And um, I did not see the real value into it until I got involved in it. And so most times uh, those persons are, aren't actively engaged or they are um, utilizing uh, their own personal experience, their own trial and error. Um, as uh, kind of this kind of one size fits all model, which we are placed in and do all out our society. Um, and so they just say, okay, you know, it's, it's one bad experience. So that must mean all the other experiences will be that way as well. And so, um, and so as an organizer, I learned that um, um, you have to take the good with the bad. What works in one neighborhood may not work in another neighborhood. What what one tactic, what works as, uh, you know, social media may be a good approach and a good tactic uh, that gets people's attention um, and get people engaged, uh, but doing the whole surveying may not be a good strategy. It all depends on what it is that you're trying to do, um, how you're trying to engage people. Do not take the one size fit all model. Do not uh, think that, um, you know, it, I have no idea. So it, it, I, I like to take every scenario um, um, and isolate it. And so, um, and so I would like to know well, what's causing these people to think this way and what's causing that person to think that way. And also know that not everyone, this is not for everyone. Not everyone is going to want to get engaged. There's usually, historically, a small handful of people that are responsible for all of the major social changes in our society. It is a handful of people that sparks the major movements in our society. And you just have to accept that, you know, and roll with it. But always call me if you get stuck somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely have to agree with that. And I think through uh, someone's like perspective, like in the mind of where someone might think that um, they might see people complaining on social media or just um, doing these sort of actions just to do them, but not necessarily carry a certain conviction or Absolutely. they don't like at the same time do other things to create change. <laughs> and I think that's where some people may have some hesitations about um, right. petitions or protests. Right. And I do we have to have our filters, do. you know, we have to filter out all those that are just, you know, want to just do things for an attention, but those who are really convicted with uh, and really are passionate about some social change. And so some things that we just had to, you know, filter out, you know, and then also, again, as I said, we have to, uh, I remember when I was, um, I was a health, I started out my professional experience as an organizer started in the healthcare field. And so I got a job as a healthcare organizer uh, with a nonprofit organization. I was responsible, only organizer in Newark for this organization, which was, I don't, bizarre and crazy. But anyway, I was responsible with trying to engage residents around their healthcare disparities. What is causing poor health uh, in this particular environment, specifically in like a large uh, apartment complex? And so I went to one of the um, locations I had to go to was a um, senior facility. And so I would get this information uh, from uh, emergency room data. You know, it's like large people from this address are coming visiting the emergency room. Uh, there's 200 residents in this building. And uh, out of those 200 residents, uh, 77 of them have visited the emergency room over 200 times. 
why is this? What's causing this? You know, what is going on? So I had to go in there and figure that out. And how do you get seniors, you know, to engage with you as a stranger? And so thankfully, I learned uh, some things about um, diabetics and the diets that diabetics should take on. And so I was, I was uh, this is all pre-COVID. And so I was able to go into the lobby area, sit down and observe. And, um, and I heard a woman talk about her having diabetes to another person who lived in the building. And so I took that information. Um, I went to the supermarket, a local supermarket in Newark. I uh, bought some bananas and um, fresh bananas and I came back um, to that lobby, I sat down, I pulled out the receipt. So I wanted people to know that I wasn't someone off the street who just like stole bananas that I bought them and I just held the seat up, receipt high so people could see it. And then I whipped, uh, pulled out the bananas, nice, fresh, ripe bananas. And then I pulled one off and then I started, I opened one, took a bite and I was like, mm, it is, this is some, this is a good banana. This is nice. This is sweet. <laughs> And they all looked at me and I said, you want a banana? I said, sure. You want a banana? You want a banana? And we started talking. We had a conversation about health. And so you just had to figure out how do you engage with people? Um, and, it, you know, and then it doesn't work. You know, that approach would not work everywhere. You know? mm -hmm. And so you find out what works. Yeah, that's, that's definitely very um, insightful and yeah, you're they're definitely correct on that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a quick question. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Go ahead, Susan. Um, thanks. This is so, so much insight. Thanks to everybody. I'm wondering, Lee, can you just really quickly point to the three things that made that shift um, possible um, so that environment shot to number one? Because that's a big shift. Can you just point to a couple things that made that successful? Was it messaging? Was it clear, concise? Was it relentless? I don't know, getting it through the mainstream media? What was it? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, shift to what? Um, when you had that successful campaign that made um, environment the number one concern. Oh, yes. Um, so some key things that we did do, it, definitely a very strong volunteer program. Um, having volunteers attending each candidate regardless of party, so Democrat, Republican, and independent, and asking questions about the environment. So in turn, when you have people asking about the environment, then you have candidates talking about the environment, and then the media picks up on it, and then it makes it into the media, people read about it, aka the candidates, and that it becomes a cycle that reinforces itself. Um, also, great uh, education. Um, meeting with each of the candidates and discussing why the environment's important and how it touched touches on so many different faucets of society. So jobs, um, health, uh, children, education, all of that, because the environment is one of those very rare issues that actually touches upon everything. And it's just a matter of education to make people understand that and see, and then you can even go into environmental justice because it's also a social issue as well. So I would think, say things like that, and also great messaging too, uh, making sure that we communicated our uh, topics and precise, effective, understandable points. Thank you Great. so much, Lee. Um, Frida, what, what's going on in the chat? What questions have people asked that we haven't gotten to yet? Yeah, of course. So um, Julia Summer wanted to know uh, Lee's opinions on why Governor Murphy uh, doesn't impose on a moratorium on new fossil fuel projects. So oh, that's a great question. Um, now, unfortunately, I, I'm not part of the Murphy administration. Um, I cannot speak on, on, you know, I cannot speak on his administration on, or his decision makings. Um, all I can say is, you know, Governor Murphy has been one of the best governors when it comes to the environment. Uh, he has made some great decisions. Now, as far as the mandatorium goes, I cannot unfortunately speak to that because I, you know, I don't even know personally. Um, but I can say that he has made some excellent um, decisions regarding the environment, especially in the expansion of open space, clean water protection, and clean air, um, and actually has made some great 
I would, in my opinion, um, moves on EJ as well, especially with the establishment of the Environmental Justice Department within the New Jersey uh, DEP. But once again, I'm not here to defend nor attack the governor. I just, I'm not privy to that information of why or why not he hasn't, unfortunately. So I wish I could answer that further or more thoroughly, but I just don't have that information, unfortunately, and I don't want to give any false impressions. I appreciate that uh, that line, Lee. Uh, Frida, do we have any other specific questions in the chat? Yeah, we do. Um, Pamela Daniels asked, how do we inspire young people 10 to 17 and young adults 18 to 24 to become organizers, knowing that there are many pathways to diverse careers in the field, such as well as the opportunity to have a social impact? And I would definitely like to uh, give an answer either before or after to take a shot at it. <laughs> Frida, let's, let's lead with you. We'll lead with you and then we'll have Tobias and Lee jump in. Okay, definitely. So as a young person, I think one of the best ways to inspire other young people is seeing that a lot of young people care about the issues. So either through social media, seeing a formation of different Generation Z leaders or different big environmental student-led groups, this inspires other students to see, oh, wow, well, all these people are doing it and, um, and it must be an important issue. And I think the issue is important, but because I see that there's a lot of other of my fellow colleagues or students doing it as well, it gives me the confidence to step out and join or try to make a change. So I think that's definitely one thing. And that is something that I had talked about in a previous conference I attended today, actually. So all these <laughs> themes are kind of running through um, and I find that completely fascinating. And I think another thing is definitely um, like the idols and not just idols, but the in people that have influenced young people, uh, whether that's um, like older, more experienced environmentalists or anyone else that must have been like a role model in their life or even a teacher. Teachers inspire. I've had teachers that have, that have inspired me. So uh, definitely having like a good foundation um, or like sets of people that have inspired or just other peers as well. I think those are like things that will inspire young people and also the motivation and the fact that uh, they feel like they can make a change uh, because if they don't feel like they can make a change, then they'll think what's the point. But if you give them that ability and you empower them, then that will definitely. Frida, before, before we jump to Tobias and Lee to answer that question, you are one of those inspiring people, inspiring other young people. And I want to make sure that that's not lost. Um, <laughs> Tobias, can you can you weigh in on uh, Pamela's question and maybe a little bit on Frida's response? Well, I mean, uh, for for us at North Science and Sustainability Inc., we have a sustainability ambassador program. Um, this program is geared towards youth between the ages of 11 and 17, and uh, they uh, engage in a wide range of um, activities around uh, equal art, uh, urban agriculture nutrition, education, uh, uh, wellness, um, um, renewable energy. And so, uh, and so we constantly, and we do this through uh, a lot of hands-on learning activities um, and, uh, and they love it. And so we get a lot of positive feedback um, from the parents um, as their children are constantly going home, sharing new information. And then with the uh, adults, um, I, I, my model is to lead by example and, um, and, and through mentorship. And so in showing, in showing people how organizing can lead to career opportunities, uh, it was my in, involvement with uh, Occupy North that led me to uh, my first uh, professional job as an organizer, community organizer. Uh, someone saw my ability to organize people and says, hey, Tobias, uh, this, this organization is looking for an organizer. We think you'd be great for it. You know? 
Um, and so and I'm like, well, I don't know anything about healthcare and this is device. They'll teach you that. They just can't teach you how to organize and you already have that down pat, you know? And so, um, and so that's how I, that's how I present it to, to uh, the two different groups. Thank you, Tobias. Um, Lee, do you have anything to add about inspiring young people to be organizers and use that skill set and see as a legitimate career path? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say the best way to inspire young people is to find them. Um, and I know that sounds kind of weird, but when we're trying to recruit more diverse organizers, I mean, people of color, women, um, the whole spectrum, really, you, there, there's been really this outdated model that they will find you. And if you're going to try to recruit more diverse people, you have to make it a point to go find them. So in my case, you know, I, here I was a college student. Um, I believe the first campaign that I volunteered for was former Congressman Rush Holtz. Um, he was uh, the congressperson before Bonnie Watson Coleman. His organizers came recruiting at Rider University asking young kids, hey, do you want to get involved in the political system uh, in oh, the wow. process, right? Um, so I said, yeah, I, I was a young political communications, political science student looking for an opportunity and they came and found me and I've been doing it ever since. Um, so I think that one of the greatest things we can do is to go looking for them through colleges, through trade schools, through high schools, things like that, and show them that there is a career path in organizing. Um, it's something that I do. Um, someone took the time, you know, the, it, it takes a little bit of work, but someone took the time to find me. And so now that I'm in a position uh, where I can do the same thing, I try to do the same thing and try to find young people of color or women. And I just take that extra step to go try to find them and show them that there's a path in it too. And understanding and trying to recognize that young people, um, specifically what's the age range, 10 to 17 and 18, 24, we all have a personal story. So listening to that personal story of what, what makes you passionate? Why do you wanna get involved? Um, is a career path in advocacy for you? And if so, what are you looking to get out of it or to give back to it? So I would just say the best way to inspire young people to get involved in these areas and to also get more diverse candidates is A, to go find them um, through non-traditional alleys um, and B, taking the second to listen to why do they wanna get involved rather than just say, hey, we need you, go do this. Um, we'll talk to you later. So right. that's kind of my perspective on it. Well, thank you so much for your perspective, Lee. Um, and Frida, I, I just want to commend you for, you know, wanting to take a stab at that as well. And for being one of those leaders that you talked about, want to make sure that you don't miss that part. All right. It's nine o'clock. I want to cover one more question because Julia, I saw your question and I'm interested in this as well. So we're gonna extend happy hour by a few more minutes. Julia said, I'd love someone, Tobias, question mark, to explain the sustainability issues around hydroponic farming versus organic soil farming. It seems that urban farming relies on hydroponic and that's a great technology. But I've also heard that hydroponic is frowned upon because it delivers nutrients to the food without enriching the soil. Tobias, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, there's nothing wrong with hydroponics. It's, um, hydroponics, um, one, is a, um, um, it's a great way to get around uh, climate change. Uh, it's a great solution for um, uh, urban agriculture, which is uh, growing uh, food in condensed um, cities where you have uh, very little access to land. And so, um, <clears throat> and it doesn't uh, necessarily replace uh, traditional ag agriculture, but it actually enhances it because it allows the growing season to be extended um, throughout the winter months. And so keep in mind that um, there's, a, you know, kind of a small window for outdoor growing in uh, the northeast uh, part of the country. And so um, hydroponics, which is growing through uh, nutrient water, uh, usually uh, in a, a greenhouse or some enclosed structure, um, allows you to extend the growing season. And it also is a, is a good solution, technological solution uh, for those who don't have access to uh, open land, uh, usually in condensed cities. So um, 
I wouldn't um, I wouldn't rule out uh, hydroponics. I wouldn't see hydroponics um, as a, a, a negative um, use of agriculture or a negative way of uh, creating um, um, generating food production. Uh, but also, but I will see it as um, an extension of allowing us to extend the growing season uh, beyond the, you know, beyond the summer months or the uh, outdoor growing months. Tobias, thank you so much for that uh, nuanced explanation of that issue. All right, it's nine o'clock, everybody. Last call at the bar. <laughs> Grab your drink. Cheers. Glasses. Empty. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for being a part of this conversation. Uh, at Civic Story, we are all, all about amplifying solutions and amplifying change makers. So I think we did that very successfully tonight. We weren't able to get to all the questions or all the conversation, but I think that just means that we will have to do this one more time. Uh, if you've been moved by our conversation, and you would like to see more events like this, I've dropped a link to Civic Stories website in the chat. And I have also dropped uh, a link to our donation page. We uh, are thankful for any support that you are able to give. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Hope to see all of you again at a similar event and we'll have happy hour soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.